Kia ora koutou, ko Ngāti Kuri Minapui Oku Iwi, ko Laragrees Toku Ingwa, and I'm a lecturer in politics and international relations at the University of Auckland. Today I'm going to speak to you about the continuing problem of voter turnout and youth voter turnout more generally that's been called the unresolved dilemma of democracy. So I'm just going to today cover firstly what this problem is, the potential solutions that the government and others have tried to enact to try to solve this issue. I'm going to cover three kind of key perspectives or theories on the problem. And then I'm just going to offer finally another perspective, probably more questions and answers today though. So here's a graph depicting the problem. So New Zealand voter turnout has been decreasing steadily over the years. And you can see this is only since 1981. Before that, we were some of the best in the world of voting. Before sort of the 90s and then heading into the 2000s, you can see this constant decline in voter turnout. In 2011, we had something called the missing million. And this was when a million New Zealanders decided not to enrol and not to vote. We always like to compare ourselves to Australia. So one thing when I'm giving a lecture that I always ask is, why does Australia beat us so much? Well, Australia has got compulsory voting. And that's another kind of potential solution to the problem is to restrict us to compulsory voting. Why does voter turnout matter? Well, at a certain point, it starts to feel, for the common person, it starts to feel like the government doesn't have that consent to govern or doesn't have that social license to make decisions on our behalves. For, okay, so on voter enrolment and turnout, we can see that this problem is even worse for young people. So in 2017, less than 70% of people under 30 bothered to vote. And you can compare this to people aged over 65. 86% of those aged over 70 and almost 90% of those aged 65 to 69 decided to vote in 2017. And there's two steps in voting. The first one is enrolling to vote. And that's just providing your name and some details to the Electoral Commission. It's illegal to not be registered, so you have to go out and register to vote. So definitely do that if you haven't already. And then the second step is to actually go and vote on the day. And so here you can see for voter enrolment, the problem is even worse, that voter enrolment is even lower. Um, and sometimes the Electoral Commission statistics show that 103% of people aged 70 plus are enrolled to vote. So older age groups really love to enrol and really love to vote relative to younger ones. The Electoral Commission, of course, is one of the kind of, it's an independent crown entity that runs our elections. And these are statistics from the Electoral Commission. But one of the really interesting things, and you might have noted it on that graph, was that little uptick in 2017. So we've shown, like recent years, there's been this really small uptick in youth voter turnout. Why was that? Well, Te Puni Kōkere got almost $5 million, that's the Ministry of Māori Affairs, to try to motivate young people, especially rangatahi Māori, to go out and vote. And so you may have seen this campaign back in 2017 with William Wairua, a comedian, and it was using technology just like Pokemon Go, where you would project William Wairua into, into space somewhere, like on your table, and he would talk to you about voting. So that was one of the things that may have increased voter turnout. The other one is, and sadly this organisation is now defunct, is Rock and Roll. And they are based on the Rock the Vote campaigns that you might have seen for the American elections. And they kind of had this pledge party polls model to try to get young people to vote through community action. So there really are a number of ways that government and community of flax roots, grassroots movements have tried to get young people to vote. There are three theories that I'd like to just briefly introduce to you today um, as to why people do or do not vote. And one is rational choice theory by Anthony Downs. This is from way back in 1957. And this is kind of apparently people make this little calculation in their head when they're deciding to choose to vote or not. So B here is the benefits the per for the person if their party or candidate were to win. Now, what benefits are there? Sometimes there's financial benefits, but oftentimes there's that little boost, that spring in your step that your team has won. But these, these are pretty marginal or pretty small for most people, right? P is the probability of your individual vote having an effect. And for most people, this is very small. Sometimes electorate races come down to a few hundred votes, but the actual realistic chance of your vote having an effect is pretty slim in any given election. And C is this cost, this cost of voting for you, the voter. And this can be costs like, for example, the cost of disclosing your information to the Electoral Commission and debt collectors find you on the roll and come after you. Or it could be something literally like you could be watching reality TV instead of learning about candidates. And just that time to actually go find somewhere to vote and go and stand there and vote. So 
Rational choice theory posits that individuals make decisions based on weighing up of all of these factors. Now, this is kind of a bit of a defunct model now because actually the benefits for people do not really outweigh the costs of voting. And so it's kind of meant to be a bit of an irrational thing to actually go and vote. Um, but this model has really given us a lot of sort of food for thought as we've moved forward throughout the decades. The other set of reasons are psychological reasons for not voting. So one way that we study voters and voting is through studies like the New Zealand election study, which is a survey which is sent out to voters after the election. And we can see that this representative group of voters, dissatisfaction with democracy is not increasing over time because people posit like maybe people are just becoming more dissatisfied with voting and elections, but we don't see that that's the case here. 1999 for people who might be a little interested is right after the government fell apart so there was a bit more dissatisfaction but this is low dissatisfaction with democracy here and when we look at things like political efficacy that is the belief that you think that you can make a difference to politics and other psychological variables over time these are not increasing or decreasing or changing much over time so this whole idea of these psychological factors don't actually seem to be a factor in this decrease in youth voter turnout and voter turnout generally now another thing here is, would you attend a political party ball? Often when I ask large classes of students, would you put on a gown and go off to like say the National or Labour Party ball, they kind of giggle a bit and they kind of think no, they, they wouldn't do that. So there's this idea that we are now less political and we have now have less of that community mindset or charitable mindset. And this is a photo from the 1958 Manawatu National Party ball. This was kind of put forth by Robert Putnam in the early 2000s, this idea that we have a decline in social capital, that more people are bowling alone now, and that we're now less likely to know our neighbours, we're now less likely to give money to charity and, and volunteer our time and maybe be a member of, of various societies or groups, and that itself has extended to voting. And this is probably one of the most popular theories of this decline in voter turnout. But then kind of one thing that I want to end on is, and that's why the problem is in scare quotes on my talk title, is that other people have put forth this idea that firstly, maybe it's not a problem. This voter turnout means that our society is operating as it should. A lot of people would say, no, that's really not the case. Um, we've actually seen a lot of youth political action through other means, whether it be online, whether it be through the school strike for climate pictured here. We've seen young people get out and, and be politically active in other means or other ways. So then we have to kind of turn the spotlight onto voting itself and the system itself. Is it that we're just blaming individuals for not voting when actually there's not really any reason for them themselves in their lives to actually have that incentive to vote. There's not that incentive there. So really in political science we sometimes like to flip this script. These are the kinds of questions that you'll be exploring as a student in politics and international relations at the University of Auckland. And for specific content on voter turnout and of course New Zealand politics and elections, feel free to take Politics 107 107G my course, New Zealand Politics. Thank you.